What is up, everybody? Ginger Runner Live, episode number 106. Tonight is a big episode because my guest is a legend, uh, an incredible athlete, incredible ultra runner, an author, uh, race director. We are going to be picking her brain tonight on all things ultra running, training for your first ultra, uh, her new book, uh, and a race coming up, the Chuckanut 50K, which she race directs or co-race directs. Very excited to have Chrissy Mail on tonight's show, uh, an honor to have her on. I hope you grabbed your beverages. I hope you guys are getting ready for Ginger Runner Live. Let's begin this thing. Ginger Runner. Yes. So excited for tonight's episode. Welcome, Ginger Runner crew, uh, for another Ginger Runner Live, episode number 106. It is Monday. Uh, the gathering of the viewers uh, around their laptops is ever exponentially growing. Uh, tonight, my guest is winner of Hard Rock 100, multi-UTMB winner. Uh, she's won the San Diego 100, Leona Divide many times. She has the FKT and the Tahoe Rim Trail. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, I'm sure she has endless stories, incredible knowledge. We're going to be picking her brain about that. If you guys have questions during tonight's show, make sure that you ask them in the chat room or via Twitter using the hashtag GRLive. I'll make sure that we'll bring those up as well. My guest, and here she is, Chrissy Mail. Yay! Chrissy, thank you for joining us. Yay! Yeah, and it's awesome to get to be on one of these episodes. Yes, finally. Um, it, it, it's great to have you. Where are you coming from? Where are you broadcasting live from? I am in my new home, the Gypsy Bada home. <laughs> I have moved 11 times in the last 11 years, and for me to actually, like, some people even call it setting down roots. That's what's happening. God forbid, setting down yeah. roots. Yeah. <laughs> so Bellingham, Washington. I'm actually Bellingham. three blocks from the start of the Chuck and Up 50K. No way. Yeah, that was, that was a key point in um, the purchase, actually. <laughs> so we've had other guests on the show in the past um, uh, talking about Bellingham. Uh, let's, let's just start there. Let's start with Bellingham. What is your connection with Bellingham, the Northwest um, in general? Is there a trail scene there? Are there amazing trails there that people uh, should definitely check out? Um, I like to think so. I grew up. Uh, just 20 minutes south of here in a little town called Bow, Washington. But actually, most of my life was um, south in Skagit Valley. So I don't really know Bellingham all that well. Went to school at UW, did all those 11 moves in 11 years, route out and about, and find myself back here, mostly because of the familiarity and being close to family. So, yeah, yeah, UW, UW here as well, Washington Pride. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why I'm really excited to have you on is because of your Northwest connection. Uh, is there something about the Northwest Trails that just continues to draw you back? Definitely. Well, this is where I cut my teeth, like Cougar Mountain down in Seattle, running with the Scots, Scott McCougar and Scott Jarek, and all the old schools. Um, I'm really familiar and comfortable on this terrain, and honestly, I think I'm a better runner here. When you have to get out and just, like today, come back like completely soaked, and then you get the sun set at night, you just feel like a little bit tougher running, I guess. Let's talk a bit about... Um Kind of how you, 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 you just said, cut your teeth. How did you get into the ultra running side of things? Were you always a competitive runner? Did it just, the, the transition to trails, did that work out naturally with, with friends and, uh, and getting out there? Or was there something that drew you specifically to trails and to ra racing an ultra? Um, I was actually living in Ecuador my junior year of college. And when I came back, the store that I was working for, formerly known as Seattle Running Company, had been bought, or it's actually Foot Zone, and then it got bought by Scott McCougarie. And I went back looking for my job, and they just hired this guy that had won his first Western State, Scott Jurek. And that crew of people uh, took about six months for me to give up my um, sleeping in on Sunday morning to join them for a 6 a.m. trail run. And then after that, they talked me into Chuck Nut, and you just got to be careful who you hang around with, I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, so Chuck Nut. Let's talk a bit about that. You are the race director of Chuckanut. It is coming up. It is just around the corner. We already had someone in the chat room talk about it being their very first ultra. Uh, what is it about this race that is so special? I've heard about it for as long as I've been running ultras um, for something that is in a, in a small corner of Washington state, but yet still has a big reputation. Uh, what is it about this race that, that makes it so special? I think, oh, for my, personally, it was my first ultra. 
And I ran that in 2000, my senior year of college. And then two years later, uh, the race directors had done it for 10 years and they decided that that was it. They were good. And I couldn't see the race going away. So I picked it up in 2003 as the race director. So this will be my 14th year doing this. Um, and that said, it's 24 years old. So it's a classic. This race has been around, you know, probably actually I was talking to Terry Sentinella the other day and this might be the oldest ultra in Washington. I need to kind of clarify that fact before I go on making that statement, but <laughs> around for 24 years. And I think people have a nostalgia for the classics. Uh, that's amazing. I, I didn't realize that. Um, for the, uh, we have a couple of viewers that did mention that this will be their first. Do you have any advice for anyone that's looking to run Chuck and Nut? Um, is it a fast course? Are there specific uh, qualities about this course that help differentiate it from others? I think the trickiest thing, and I actually tried to change the course in 2008 because the first and last 10 K is on this relatively flat trail called the Inner Urban, and that's our access from Bellingham down to the Chuckanut Mountain Trails, uh, Fragrance Lake and all that. Mm -hmm. the ridge. So on the way down, it feels great. It's now 6.7 miles from where we start. Cruisy, warm you up, run, and then you go into the trails and you get 30K of up, up and down, 5,000 feet of gain. And you come back out and you hit that inner urban again and you remember it being so easy in the morning, but suddenly 6.7 miles flat is mentally tough. So I mm -hmm. think that's the trickiest part if you've got leg turnover and those last 6.7 you will pick up carnage like I think that you see a lot of that on that last trail so my advice is eat at the last aid station I'm a big proponent of fueling and what happens is you come off the fragrance lake trail you're feeling amazing you just bomb downhill for three miles you're like oh, I got this six miles to the finish you get two miles out from the aid station and you'll completely bonk so you just stop take care of yourself that last go will be a lot lot more enjoyable there's this hill people have told me about it i haven't seen it with my own eyes called chin scraper uh yeah. what is it about that that uh people need to be aware of uh doug mckeever and richard west the founders of the race uh named it such it's named after it's called actually little chin scraper because it's the small version of the one that's in the wasatch front 100. Mm -hmm. so uh you come up it's the last climb of the the last big climb of the race, there's a couple bumps after that, but the last big climb of the race, it comes at mile 22, 23, somewhere in there. So you've got some, got some time on your legs and it's, it's pretty steep named appropriately. Like if you, if your feet go out, your chin's gonna, gonna hit ground. So and it's not very long. It's just, it's just there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does race directing ever get any easier? I mean, kind of figure things out, but I'm always, I, do, I love this. I, I do one race a year and I put my heart and soul into it. And there's definitely been years I've finished and been like, that's it. I can't do this again. But then, you know, just like any ultra a month later, you're signing up for next year. So I, um, you get the, I think you get systems figured out. I've got a ton of spreadsheets just like I do in the back of the book. I'm a total list dork and that makes it a lot easier just to kind of tick things off year after year. And is there uh, like a question or an email that you get constantly? I love this question for race directors. Uh, something that you get constantly that you wish you could just answer publicly so everyone knows the answer and hopefully it doesn't keep asking. One of those, uh, one of the simple, simple questions. I'm sure it's on the website somewhere. Um, I actually haven't had a lot of questions this year. That's um, great. That's good. Either the website's good or people talk enough to each other and it's all out there. The big, I guess the biggest one is um, dropouts. That's the one that's always a bummer for me because I don't want. Yeah. If you sign up, I want you there. And I always feel bad when people are like, oh, I can't make it for whatever reason, you know, injury or family or schedules or whatever. I just want everybody to show up. Yeah. And this is a first come first serve race. It's not lottery yet, right? Yeah. And we did try lottery a couple of times. My, it used to crash uh, the ultra sign up uh, website. So we had to do lottery for a year, but I, I've always preferred first come first serve. And now there's so many races that it doesn't fill up right away. It took about a week this year. So I think it's, it's fine. Yeah. That's good. Um, I want to talk a bit about your, your, your career. Cause you've been ultra running for 16 years. Is it 16 years? I think. First, first was checking at 2000, so this is my 16th year. 16th year. Um, you, you've had 
a variety of experiences i can only imagine uh multiple races multiple very difficult races um but then in in recent years attempting a lot of the fkt excuse me this beer is uh is, is interesting um <laughs> But most recently, the Tahoe Rim Trail FKT supported uh, is an incredible feat. Do you prefer now that FKT adventure, the adventure of sitting with maps and planning with a crew, or do you enjoy the race environment? Are, are you finding yourself kind of torn between the two, or do you still love them both equally? I'm probably leaning more towards the adventure runs and not necessarily always FKT. It doesn't have to be sure. For record or whatever but just like yeah the maps and making lists and talking with crew i always like to have people around me i've been one of those people <laughs> the whole running time or running career yeah. i still find myself drawn to the races for the community aspect i love having the opportunity to just reconnect with the community and i think that's a big part of why the race directing calls me back every year is i have an opportunity almost to create a place or a stage for everybody to come together uh, early in the season it's kind of a kickoff race and i, I love that aspect so uh, i love going to being a part of that as well other people's reasons um having been a part of uh, gary robbins wonderland fkt last year and i know that you also had a wonderland fkt at one point uh i'm sure you're very familiar with that trail but also having um a series of uh, crew members around you and also into tahoe we had some crossover crew members that uh both jen and jeff were crew oh, for gary as well as crew for you uh how important is it having a solid crew around you in such uh important uh, adventures for me it's key i love having those faces to look forward to and it I have to say that Tahoe Rim crew there was 12 adults i don't know how i did it 12 adults that i was able to pull together I think they showed up on Saturday and left on Wednesday. It's just, you know, who has friends that can, oh, and by the way, run 70 miles with you? Like, <laughs> they were so incredible. And a lot of them, like, knew one or, like, one or, or another person. Like, Jen and Jeff came, and mm -hmm. uh, Tina and Darcy came, and Monica and Kathleen came. But none of them had all worked together. And I remember, like, I don't think we were, no, we were just, like, 80 miles, 90 miles in. And I had, pla I had planned, of course, with all my spreadsheets that somebody would get, you know, the first crew would crew me and the other one would leap ahead and get some sleep. And yep. then first crew would jump ahead and sleep and the second crew would crew me. And they were all together at like mile 90. We're like, we started at 10.30 or 11 in the morning and this is the next day sometime, or yeah, the early the next morning. I was like, wait, you're supposed to be ahead sleeping. And they're like, Just don't worry about it. We've got this. And it was just like, <laughs> such a relief of how much fun they were all having i didn't have to worry about anything if they it really makes a difference like when you have people that just gel like that and make all of that stuff happen talk about a simple find all i had to do was move forward like those guys even picked my clothes like when it's time to change clothes they told me what to wear i didn't have to plan any of that it was awesome <laughs> that is that is pretty awesome were you at all yeah were you, that's actually a really great question is were you worried about the crew at all or did it just get to the point when you knew you didn't have to worry about a thing everything was taken care of and you could just focus on moving forward it was exactly at that point because i was worried about like was everybody like moving around did they none of them had really been there gary um gary gallon jumped in last minute and totally like helped get people around to like the sneaky spots and stuff so i had been worried about like, would they be able to read my maps and my directions? Could they get to these spots that I thought they could on the map? And it it just, worked. it was like stars aligning, everything worked perfectly. And I have like two or three, maybe up to five stories like that, yeah. where life and um, events, races worked out so well. And this one was right up there, one of those top fives. Uh, it was an incredible thing to follow just via social media. Uh, Cause as you mentioned, you had a huge crew and they were Social media blitzing. It was pretty fun to, to follow over the course of those days. Um, 47 hours, 29 minutes. Uh, you bested the previous supported FKT. Uh, I believe uh, the math is an hour 48, which is insane on a 175 mile trail, the Tahoe Rim Trail. Uh, huge props. Can't even fathom it. Um, will there, will, what, is there another FKT in your mind or any sort of adventure that you are maybe planning or plotting in the future? 
Um, I love the Sierra. So, and uh, Gina, who was on that um, Tahoe crew, mm -hmm. she and I are planning something in the Sierra sometime this summer, but probably later in the summer. I awesome. Things like, so Chekana is kind of my end of year. So a lot of people start planning for the next year at like Christmas or New Year's. I have a fiscal year because of checking it. So I'm just starting to think. I just signed up for the Quicksilver 100K. So that's my first just something to have on the calendar. And I'll start planning a little bit better. Give me two more weeks and then I'll have a better idea. Have you done that one before? I haven't. And I'm really trying to seek out new events. So yeah. It's uh, it's great. Uh, a lot of history in those mountains. I uh, there's a little video that I did from last year's race. It was my first time running that event for a Western qualifier. Some of the hills are pretty gnarly. Nothing that you haven't experienced uh, with your resume, but uh, yeah, it's a real, real fun event. Have you heard speedy, like good smooth trails? Super smooth, zero technical. Um, the single track sections are awesome. The fire roads are wide when uh, whenever you hit them, which is a majority of the time, but. Uh, it got really hot, so a lot of it's exposed, and there's a, a big climb called Dog Meat, which leaves mile 25. I think it's a six or seven mile climb. Um, it does not end when you think it ends, and it continues to roll, but once you get to mile 30, when it's over, 31, it's 50K mark. Once you get there, the rest is like off to the races. Um, that's, that's my quick and dirty advice for the race, but it's beautiful. You're going to love it. It's beautiful. Cool. I am wanting to talk about your new book, Running Your First Ultra. I think this is probably going to be one of those episodes that all my viewers are going to have to watch um, because I feel like this book is something that everyone should read, first of all. Uh, and I think uh, Chrissy is just so knowledgeable in all of these topics, not only as a race director, but as someone who's, who's experienced race environments across the globe in all sorts of conditions, but also as uh, a FKT and adventure runner as well with some of the best in the world as well. Uh, so if you guys have questions or watching live, ask them in the chat room or ask them via Twitter using uh, GR Live. We'll make sure those questions get asked. I already have a couple. So Chrissy, um, these are gonna be right up your alley here. We have one from Tyler. What strategies do you use to mentally block out the pain during a race? I, I don't think I block it out. It's part of the experience. Um, and if the pain's getting too overwhelming, I feel like it's usually something about fueling. It's because think about how like hangry you get when you're not like fueling during the day. And now you add that you're running however long your race that you've chosen. So I feel like if you're having a spot where you're, it's more like doubt and pain and all these things are creeping in and you, just don't know if you can move forward. Mm -hmm. you probably need one more than one gel. It might be a bacon avocado quesadilla. That's what got me out of the Mount Rose spot on the TRT. Like this usually has to do with calorie deficiency. And then the other thing is, is like I chose to be there. I signed up for this. I traveled to it usually. Put money into it. This this is this is part of the experience. So just kind of look up and look around and see where your two legs have taken you from that. That seems to get me through a lot of the harder times. Uh, you know, I, I'm actually really just curious. Um, what was the impetus for writing the book? Is it something that uh, have you coached in the past? Is it something that you really just enjoy helping guiding people into their first ultra? Was there something about your first ultra experience that you wanted to help share or, or learn from? Uh, what, where was the, uh, the history with the book? Um, I actually was approached by the publisher to write it. They liked what I had to say on my blog and in some articles and things. And when we were talking about what approach would I take in terms of, I know ultra, where do you want to write? I drew on the last five years of coaching and I've had such a great time working with first time ultra runners, whether they're running their first 50K or first 50 mile or 100 miler. And I do kind of like a little interview type process with the person, not interview, but just kind of each other, just questioning each other and seeing if we would be good to work together. Sure. I am always, I've always been drawn to the people that are seeking out their first ultra. So there's something about that, that unknown for them, the questions that are asked and the one that gets me, I love it at checking it is like complete disbelief on their face when they finish because they've accomplished something they didn't think was possible. So I love going through that process with people and that's why we titled the book the way we did, Running Your First Ultra. Yeah. I've since learned that I kind of pigeonholed myself. I've said that in a couple other interviews where I'm hearing from people like, Chrissy, I've run 50 ultras and this book is great. Or 
I'll never run an ultra, but I still found something that would be helpful. So the title maybe is a little misleading because it can be open to other runners as well, but that's who I was passionate about is those first time runners and seeing them go through the process. Well, you know, and I think, uh, I think as an ultra runner, we're always learning anyways. I mean, I, I, I've been doing this for a fraction of the years that you've been doing this, but I still feel like I have lots to learn. It's part of why I do this show and bring on people like yourself is because I'm no expert. Uh, and I, I know a lot of experts that aren't experts. And I feel like a book like this is a perfect example of we're all still there to learn. And, uh, you know, we can always do with the wild card up our sleeve. And if we come to those moments where we don't know what the hell's going on with our body at mile 50 or 60 of an ultra, it's always good to have a wealth of knowledge to, to bounce back on. Um, so you would absolutely recommend this to uh, people of all seasoned uh, ultra running resumes? Yeah, if you're interested in learning. I mean, I've done a lot of reading of other, other sports athletes, their kind of memoirs and stuff. And I feel like mm -hmm. I'm always learning something. That's why I'm still in it 16 years later. I can't figure it out. I still want to, like, there's more to look <laughs> at. Uh, that's actually, uh, that's another great question. Is there a secret to longevity in this sport? You, you, you see a lot of people and talk to a lot of people that have been doing this for so long, since the 80s or even before, and, and you can't help but just be in awe of someone who's able to run such long distances for such long periods of time for so many years. Is there a secret? Is there any advice that you could give as someone who's had an incredible career, 16 years so far and still going, uh, that can help us elongate our own careers? Uh, I think that just keeping that desire alive and a lot of times that actually comes from taking time away. So knowing when enough is enough. Yeah. Um, and just taking a break. It doesn't have to mean that you're done as, you're done as a runner, but just finding something to pull it away from this, the focus that can happen. We get so excited about being runners and the places we can go and the races we can sign up for and all of that. And just, I've definitely done it. I've gone through two, three years of racing solid straight. And then remember 2008, I woke up and was like, what, why do I own so many shoes? <laughs> I, mean, I went through a whole year of trying to like kind of reset and yeah, actually, I ran the grindstone 100. I was sicker than dog. I've been working a new job, and it's like this is it. If I, you know, this race is it. If I am runner, I'll finish it, and that'll be. I'll know that I'm a runner, and if not, if I call. I can pull the plug and find something else. And I actually ended up. It was the first grindstone, and I ended up winning it. And I was like, well, I guess I just answered my question. <laughs> yeah, I will be a runner. <laughs> I just needed to find a better balance with it. So, yeah. Great. And, Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, just finding balance. The only other one, can I add one more? <laughs> of course. Yeah, absolutely. Is to celebrate your finishes. Like, here's this thing that you tackle that you think is, like, not possible, and you do it, and the first question you get asked is, what's next? And if I just, like, take a moment and be, like, right now, like, celebrating this 100-mile finish, that's what's next. I'm going to be right here. That's, I would be my other thing. Just take a moment, take a week, three weeks, months, whatever you need to like really acknowledge. Cause you put what, six to nine months into training for this thing. You can give yourself some time to celebrate that you did it. Hell yeah. That's probably <laughs> the best advice that we've had yeah. on the show ever is to celebrate your victories. Absolutely. Well, you've got it in your whole mantra, party hardest, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely. Uh, another great question here from Kimo Sabe, and I want to make sure I get this uh, get this in the interview. Um, what's the number one mistake newbies make training for their first ultra? And what's the most common mistake newbies make on race day? Uh, total, just off the cuff, gut response is training too much. Like thinking, taking this huge accomplishment on and, or huge distance on and feeling like I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, and not knowing when to back off and like taper and recover and feel good and be comfortable like yes i've got it i'm good yeah and then on race day is probably wearing something new like new shoes or a new pack or a new shirt because you got this new thing for race day and then it chafes you or gives you blisters or it you try a new food and it gives you stomach problems like having everything the only thing that should be new on race day is going further than you've ever gone before. and your book kind of walks 
people through a multi-week process and training and, and all that kind of thing, right? Your book kind of lays it out in, in stages, right? Yeah, there's different plans for each distance. Uh, a great question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just 48-week plan for 124-week plan for 50K, 24-week plan. Uh, good question here from Randy. How have you lasted so long without having that dreaded runner burnout? I think you kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, now with there's so many discussions about runner fatigue and adrenal fatigue and all these kind of things. Uh, how, do, how have you managed to avoid that? Um, I'm sure I've had it to some degree, but fortunately not to the point that it's totally taken me out of the sport. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I was able, fortunately I worked with a doctor early on just by chance and learned a lot about nutrition and it's i'm totally guilty of getting caught up in the like light is fast losing weight getting down to race weight trying to maintain race weight for too long and mm -hmm. i learned i learned if i don't stay at my base weight as opposed to race weight my base weight that's when injury and fatigue and all that stuff seems to creep in for me so uh when people ask what do you eat i say a lot i don't have like a like a set diet it's fuel as far as like a lot of times when I'm home I can prepare better meals and be a little bit more thoughtful but when I'm out on the road it's I try to be but if it's the choice between eating and not eating I'll eat it whatever you know the, the option is so fueling I think is a big part of avoiding yeah and then like what we said earlier taking breaks and celebrating your victories and your accomplishments and just being being with whatever your experience is I'm I'm just super curious what your racing fuel uh, strategy or adventure strategy with fuel is. Do you deal with uh, like gels and and the sort of quick products, or do you use real food? Is there a, a specific thing that you kind of strive to achieve? Uh, yeah, I, I work with Cliff Bar and First Endurance, and actually I can power down a lot of that stuff in terms of gels and blocks bars. I kind of nibble on out here and there, and then I tend to go towards real food. Uh, TRT is like fresh in my mind, even though it was in September, but it was the most recent thing I've done. Yeah. Um, so like mashed potatoes and or instant mashed potatoes, uh, noodles, macaroni and cheese with, um, we put moose meat in there. That was really good. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A good friend of mine just called it. Um, what else? Oh, and then the saving grace was the bacon avocado quesadilla at mile 110. When the wheels were definitely falling off. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> in a, an event like that or uh, an adventure like that, when you reach a low, as someone who's run so many ultras, do you know that it's going to come around or is there a doubt in your mind that maybe this is that distance or that, that um, expenditure where it doesn't come back around and you've kind of gone off the deep end? And did it for you at the TRT? Did it come back around after that uh, low point? Um, thankfully, it did, and I give like one hundred percent of it to the crew. Like I definitely was in the doubt, you know, pain cave, doubt cave, whatever you want to call it, and uh, came off Mount Rose, which was a section, one of the few sections I had pre-run. Mm -hmm. um, in the week leading up to it, I'd hiked the Tahoe Rim Trail in June in seven days, so I knew. Pretty well knew the trail, but had done a couple pre runs and I'd done all this visualization of how great I was going to feel coming off Mount Rose. And it was the lowest spot for me mentally and emotionally and physically. And I had all these great girls with me Betsy Nye came out, Jenny Capel came out, um, Jen Benna was out there, and Kathleen and Monica were already pacing me. Like I had this like harem, like all of us cruising down the mountain. And do you think I could get my legs to turn over? I had this. I was just so hopeful to like take those girls for a good run and I was walking and they were taking good care of me and anyways total full of doubt and I came down and the crew knew that I was going to come out of it like there yeah. was nothing on their mind that they were going to be able to put me back together I was going to come back around whatever happened um, total 100% props to them so sometimes you've got to lean on those people to get you back on I think how long did it take you to actually get it turned around um, I don't know how long I, I did a full change close. Um, Darcy uh, worked on my foot for a bit. I had a pretty good pain going in my arch. I wasn't sure if it was a cramp or stress fracture. You know, you go crazy in your head. Yeah, of course. 
Um, I, I could have sat there for 15 minutes. It might have been 50 minutes. I don't know. There was like a little party happening there at the Mount Rose Aid Station. That's where the most people were. I, just, yeah. I couldn't believe that. that was my lowest. But probably there's like a serendipity to that, right? Like you need. I needed all of that energy. I needed J.B. Bennett to stand there and tell me like, hey, this is what you've got left. You've totally got this. Darcy working on my feet. Gina making jokes. You know, Jeff and Jen making quesadillas. Like everything was happening at that time for a reason. And of course, you want to be like, hey, it's good. We're going. It's great. And <laughs> I, just, <yeah. laughs> I was leaning on those guys pretty heavy at that point. <laughs> did uh, Did Jeff and Jen bring the tambourine? We did not have tambourine. For some reason, that's all I remember of them at, at uh, Rainier FKT was just this tambourine. They would use it at every pit stop or <laughs> every place that Gary stopped, and it was like it got it got him the energy. The tambourine worked, so I wasn't sure if they brought it to, to Tahoe. I had mean, a road trip down. They could have. I don't remember hearing it. <laughs> a good question here from Pete. Chrissy, you've contributed a lot of writing to various magazines and websites. Was writing a book difficult by comparison, or did it just come naturally? Oh, that's a good question. I have to ask that. Um, I, well, full story, I'm actually also trying to work on a like memoir of all these crazy stories. It seems weird to write a memoir at 38, but hey, why not? Um, and I think writing is a super cathartic process, like to go back through and maybe learn the lessons that maybe you learned some when you were there, but then you learn them again when you go back and write about it. Yeah. Uh, so I've been working with a writing coach for a year and trying to get oh. those chapters written and things like that. So when this project came up with Page Street, I signed a contract December 22nd. My manuscript was due March 1st. So that's like two months to write this whole training manual. So fortunately, I'd done some legwork not knowing this was coming, but it made the process happen. And I'm not a nine to fiver, so there was definitely some seven to seven, seven to 10 days where I was working you know, 12, my own little ultra, if you will. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember hearing in other interviews that you had a really short turnaround, right? So for this one, it was two months or something like that? Yeah, really, yeah. It's crazy. Uh, Kimosabe, a regular viewer of the show, has another question for Chrissy. What do you think the mid and back of the Packers should not do that the elite runners do on race day? should do but the elites don't uh opposite so what should the uh, mid and backpackers not do that elites might do i feel like it's that's the cool thing i'm having a hard time with that one i feel like that's what's so cool about ultras is we all line up and we're all out there to have an experience and whether dave laney's standing next to you or you know, who, you know, I'm, not, I'm gonna start throwing names, but anyways, there's this group of people that's all out there to have the adventure, and I don't. We're, we're all there. We're like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to differentiate. I don't know that there is. We, there's something about those longer distances that it just kind of evens the playing field. You see it across gender. You see it across age. You see it like, there, it's it's a really cool sport that way. So sorry to not answer. <laughs> no, I I think that's great because uh, yeah, the question's definitely uh, a little a little confusing. But at the same point, like I think the elites are doing the same thing you're doing. They're pushing, you know, as hard as you're pushing. It, maybe they're just faster than you. But I think everyone goes through the same lows and the same highs. So yeah, uh, a good answer. Uh, there was another one. Here we go. Steven asked Chrissy if you have done a couple fifty k's, would you recommend doing a fifty mile race before attempting a hundred k? Uh, I'm going to dovetail with this question is, do you have a set number of like, do 350Ks before you try your first 50? Is that something that maybe that's covered in the book? I um, don't know that I covered that in the book. I mean, there's a natural progression that maybe makes sense yeah. like and to, to the logical mind. But growing up, I mean, I, grew, I started this at 22. So I realized my world is kind of skewed in terms of what I think is normal, like that was what I grew up in. And I saw people do a hundred miler as their first ultra race. So there's, it doesn't have to look a certain way, but I guess if you were to want to look at like the way the body works and how your, your training can progress and all of that and get super scientific about it. Yeah, it makes sense to like test your body out and move up in distance as you feel comfortable with 
your training and your time. I think those are the factors that come in more rather than like do three 50 Ks and then a 50 miler and then a hundred miler. It's yeah. more about like, what do you have time for? What does your life allow? Are you able to maintain weight while you're doing all of this? Can you stay injury free through your first however many races? Like those personal factors seem to come in and play a bigger hand than the sum formula. Uh, a question that we often ask coaches and, and other um, elite runners, and this is, comes from Richard C. Do you always have a specific goal when planning a run or do you just go for a four hour run and see what happens? I would say it varies. Um, I'm working with a group of athletes up here in uh, Bellingham, getting them ready for their first check in at 50 K. And it's been really fun for me to have a bit more structure to my own training mm -hmm. and training them. And we're using the 50 K plan from, running your first ultra and going to the track on Wednesday nights and doing five minute intervals or meeting um, on Saturdays and doing our long trail run. And uh, so I think each run has its own structure in terms of what it's, what you're hoping to get out of it. And it, that that's a key part of training. Like you have to have your recovery days. You have to do some up tempo days. You have to do long run days. All of that has to be a part of the process or whatever. Yeah, we, we often talk about uh, on the show whether or not uh, do you feel it's appropriate to do seven days of running, six days of running with the with a day off, back-to-back uh, -back days on weekends of long miles. Uh, does your plan or does your strategy have any sort of uh, layout in that way of here's where the big mileages should go and, and that kind of thing? Uh, definitely. Uh, I like to... Uh, I found what works best for my own body and what I've seen work really well for my coaching clients mm -hmm. is building for three weeks and then hitting a recovery week and really letting the training that you've done take like set into your body. And those recovery weeks are the biggest part of training, which it's so easy to just keep climbing up in mileage and yeah. to really acknowledge that, okay, this week is all about getting antsy again is kind of one way to describe it so that you're ready to go train again and you're excited about it and your body's recovered and you get through any nibbles that we're kind of starting to creep up or whatever, catch up on calories, whatever it is. That was probably the hardest thing about writing a book is when I work with clients, I really enjoy adding life. Like how does their life factor into what they're doing? Yeah. And so we'll shift programs around. Sometimes they only build for two weeks and then they get a recovery week because just the way that stress, uh, life stresses are factoring in, three weeks isn't manageable. So um, writing a book about that, you that's a set plan. It's printed, like it's hard copy. How do you adjust for life? And so that's my biggest thing with the book is hopefully getting people to tune into their own bodies that here's this plan laid out, but what's the best for me? What can I do to get to the start and finish line? Really good question here from Tyler. Uh, Ginger Runner and Chrissy, I know many people, including myself, can sometimes get caught up. This happened to me this weekend on Saturday during a race. Uh, they can get caught up in the adrenaline and go out too fast at the start. Do you have a mantra or something that you do to help stick to your pace or your plan? Well, sounds like you have a recent story. You should answer it. <laughs> no, it was just me being stupid, going out too fast. And you know it. Like, you I knew it by mile three or four. I was like, what are you doing? You're going way too fast. <laughs> Do you have anything that you tell yourself before a race or, or like for, for you, perfect example, if you were running uh, an elite level race, 50K, 50 miler, 100 miler, and you are with other incredible, fa incredibly fast elite women, uh, do you stay with them? Do you run your own pace? Like, do you, do you try to push the pace and, and, and keep up with them and stay in that front lead group? Or do you just do what Chrissy does? I really, 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 really try to do what Chrissy does. The one time that I didn't I actually I gave a TED talk uh, in 2011 mm -hmm. and it was about my experience running Western States followed by UTMB in 2009 and it totally it, it captures that what happened when I went out too fast and so I am a big proponent of listening to your body and knowing that it's gonna come like your race will happen yeah Sometimes it's really hard. What I've learned, if I'm if I'm really tuning in, there, I feel like I have a governor on my body. You know, like with the little go-karts and stuff, they can only go a certain speed. Mm -hmm. like I feel like my body won't go really fast in the beginning. It, it fights me so hard. Like I'm, I have to work so hard to go that pace in the beginning where it comes much more naturally for me in the end or, you know, middle towards the end of the race. So if I just 
kind of listen to that and hold back in the beginning. But obviously, some people don't have that. They can go out and realize four miles in, like, oh, what did I do? So. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was just a, that was just a stupid Ethan move. Uh, it was a sh it was a half marathon. And in my mind, I was like, oh, treat it like a training run, but like have fun. And I was like, oh, half marathon, that's nothing. And then the first four miles, you realize that you're trying to keep up with the people who are, you know, track stars running uh, their first trail half. And you're like, this, you're an idiot. You're not fast. So slow it down. You're an idiot. Uh, so I learned my lesson pretty quick. <laughs> uh, so let's have to learn a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I have no problem learning that lesson. It just sucks. It sucks for about an hour. Um, Roger asks, question for Chrissy, how do you know when it's time to drop from a race? Sorry to be such a downer. He has that little uh, notation at the end there. Um, I've personally, I've dropped from two races and both, the first one I went into it injured, it was the North Face 50 and I popped my calf like just, I think it was two weeks prior I'd done my last big training run. And I went on this easy little run from my house, I guess a week and a half out was the Wednesday you know, 10 days out and my calf just boom. And I got it to a point where I could run for an hour, but then started the race and it, I was going to be limping for 40 some miles and you're going to mess up your hips. Yeah. Vision. Um, but the harder one honestly was uh, UTMB 2011. I was over there and had overtrained, went out and hung out in Chamonix for too many weeks prior and played in those beautiful mountains and couldn't say no when people asked to go on training runs or show me this section or whatever. And I got to 100K and I just, I wasn't having fun anymore. I missed my crew at a aid station and was low on fuel. And I think just being that much overtrained, I didn't have any reserves to just suck it up and go forward. Yeah. Um, so those are my personal stories with Dana. How do you know when? Uh, check in like what is it what's like just before you have just i'm out cut the bracelet like really just sit down and have a moment like can i come back from this do i want to mm -hmm. you know because there's there is that like you could sit at michigan bluff for two hours and walk the rest of the way in and do you want to have that experience just to finish or like is it better to you know run another day live you know live to run another day or something like that so just make the decision so that you're not living afterwards going, oh, I got to get back there and make up for like a monkey on my back or whatever. Just be really solid in your decision. Don't, if it's such a harsh or rash decision, then maybe that'll, that'll cause that like long, that long term that the grief about it. Yeah. If you're like okay with it when it happens, then you know what? This is what I had to do today. Nathaniel has another good question. Uh, how would you, or how would a flatlander like me better train for an ultra with elevation change? I live in the Gulf Coast and it's pretty flat for miles and miles. Jeff, that's tough. Um, there are crazy things. I've, there's great people. Um, Ty Tyler Curiel, he's a legend in our sport, uh, would train for hard rock living. And, and he did it a lot on like the stairs of a building, like found the highest tower building that he could. Um, I think the trickiest part is getting, if you can, just get yourself out there early or go yeah. visit before, maybe, you know, make a vacation to go train in the area. I remember I did that for Wasatch the first year I ran it and went out and like ran the outdoor retailer show and ran sections of the course. So I knew, at least knew what I was up against in my own training back at home. Um, and I think uh, a big, I'm a big proponent of core work and not just like having great abs, but like keeping your body strong as a whole and counter to the running movement strong, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. those things really help over, you know, overcome, but help better prepare you for maybe terrain that you can't work on in your own backyard. Uh, another good question regarding crew members. Any tips to give for a first time crew member? really check in with your runner beforehand. There's a lot of stuff that's going to come up during the race. And so having a best laid plan beforehand so that you know where they're at and when they're making, if they're making kind of irrational comments or something, you have that grounded spot from what they talked about a week before the race rather than just being so caught up in their, 
the frenzy of the moment or whatever. So just knowing what their true intention of the race is. And that kind of goes back to that when to DNF question. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good conversation to have before you even start. Like, if I come in with a sprained ankle, am I going to limp to the finish or not? If my stomach completely goes, am I going to sit there and try and fix it? Or am I okay being done at that point? Like, answering all of those questions beforehand so that you you said it like this is what what we're going to do and it's hard to predict all of that but yeah. as much as you can prior that's that tends to help yeah and there's a, a question here that also relates uh to my season i'm running trans rockies it's my first race uh at altitude i've done many races that don't deal with anything over six i think six or seven thousand feet is about as high as i've gone in a race environment uh, the question comes from Pete. Any tips for training for a race that is at altitude while you're training at sea level? Um, the best thing is just get yourself freaking fit. <laughs> as, as fit as you can going in, and as you go into altitude, hydration and sleep are the two things you can control. Okay. So if you're rested or underhydrated, those two things can uh, make altitude, the impact of altitude more prep, like present in your body, you might feel it more. So if you can really take care of those things going into it, you might have a better chance. And just, you know, being aware of your environment. I am working at less oxygen. So I am not going to be able to run the same pace. Maybe take the speed part off of your watch so you're not worried about running a certain pace that you've been running in training. There you go. And what about dealing with... Now to the hypoxico. Uh, yeah. I've never used one, but I know how Kerner trained for hard rock living in one of those, so... Did you train for hard rock with anything uh, specific? Uh, I was able to go out there three weeks early, which I think okay. was a huge benefit of seven. And what about heat? We had a question in here regarding like really hot temperatures. If you're if you're training in not as hot temperatures as race day, any specific training or anything like that? Um, again, just get yourself really fit. I've seen and heard of people like wearing extra clothes just to simulate being warm. It's really hard. To do that, I've done the actual the sauna training where you go for a long run and then get into a sauna and maybe do core work or get in and out of the sauna a lot and just get your body used to sweating. Really hydrate while you're in there. I've done that trying to prepare for Western States a couple of times. The year it was freaking cold. Um, <laughs> good preparation there. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm so about just getting out for a run. I think that's why I'm a runner and not like a triathlete or a mountain biker or I just, I love the simplicity of it. So sometimes I try not to overthink that stuff too much. Sure. Just be as best prepared I can. Be well fueled, well trained, well rested. Give it, give it your best shot. Now, before we let Chrissy go, because uh, we're, we're getting close to the 7 p.m. mark, and uh, I want to make sure that we let Chrissy go, but uh, there were some questions that were not answered. Um, if you have a remaining question that Chrissy wasn't able to get to, make sure you give her a, a tweet or shout her out on social media and see, uh, hopefully she can get back to you uh, on that sort of thing. But Chrissy, I was really curious, um, who inspires you? Because you inspire a lot of people. People uh, are going to be buying your book because they look up to you. You're an incredible athlete. You've done some amazing things uh, in the ultra world and, and you're a legend essentially and people really look up to you. Who do you look up to? Thank you. Those are really nice comments. Um, at anybody with passion to be honest with you and I get asked that question in interviews and stuff and I I, I always remember this girl uh, that took us surfing for the first time when I was working at Montreal and it was pouring down rain. It was Washington off the coast. And we'd gone out, tried our best, come back in, taken the wetsuits off. We're sitting in a coffee shop getting warm. And she is out. She is looking out the window. And you, I looked at her and go, you want to go back out in that, don't you? She's like, look, the waves are coming in. And just that passion, like anybody that's got passion for whatever it is, whether it's running, surfing, cycling, I think movement is a part of it for me. I, I really I really like the, the physical aspect of passion for myself, but um, yeah, I'm really inspired by anybody that finds it and like lives it. That's awesome. 
Uh, with all new guests on the show, guests that we haven't had on the show before, I have a little thing that I like to do at the end of the show where I just rapid fire questions at you. They're very easy. You just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, you let me know, Christy, when you're ready, and I'll just uh, fire them off. I just wanted to throw back to you real quick, even kudos yeah. to you. Look at the crowd you've got and all these questions and everything coming in. I think it's so cool what you've created with this ginger ale. It's, uh, it's been a pretty incredible journey. Started five years ago, 2011, January 24th, I believe. And uh, Ginger Runner Live, we're now at 106th episode. And Chrissy, like it, every week the community comes back. Uh, they're, they're eager as ever to meet the new guests. And uh, like the questions are fantastic. And I can't get to them all because they, they're constant. Uh, so I want to remind those watching live again, reach out to Chrissy because she's an incredible resource. Get her book, first of all, get her book. Uh, just support her because I think that's that's the first and foremost thing you can do for any ultra runner. Because, uh, you know, it's not like a high paying gig or anything like that. Uh, so so anytime anyone creates something like that, definitely just support. Um, and it's a valuable resource as well. But yeah, Chrissy, every week it's, it's pretty amazing. And uh, the follow up on reviews and films that I produce is like, the viewers are the best thing Ever. They are so supportive. And uh, you are going to get a bunch of new Twitter followers tonight, I guarantee it. Um, so, yeah, you let me know when you're ready and we'll, we'll fire through these questions. Well, yeah, thanks for having me on. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, cool. What was your very first race? Uh, Ultra was checking at 50 day. Favorite running movie? Yeah. I like the pre movies. That's what comes to my mind. <laughs> Trails or road? Trails. Favorite place to run? Out my back door. This might be a tough one, but bucket list race. I don't know if it's a race, but I want to go to New Zealand and run everywhere. Yes, yes. <laughs> Guilty pleasure TV show? Friends. <laughs> we just finished all those seasons. We uh, we also had that as a guilty pleasure, well, both my wife been. and I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Up high, sea forever, or deep forest, sound of water? Up high, sea forever. Favorite pre-race meal? Anything with avocado. Favorite post-race indulgence? Thai food. Uh, had Thai, just uh, my whole plate, all, I get to eat it all. <laughs> and finally, your current running kicks. Um, it's a prototype from Basque, I'm pretty psyched. Um, we'll be launching this fall. Nice. That is it. You survived. That is it for Ooh. questions. Awesome. Uh, so remind people where they can find you on social media, website, where they can get the book, just so they know. I keep it really easy. It's all my name. As long as you can spell my last name, you've got me. So Chrissy Mail. So on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. My website's ChrissyMail.com. It's pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> and uh, the name is just in the title of this show, too. So if you, if you needed help spelling mail, it's, it's right there. M-O-E-H-L. Very, very easy. But yeah. Go subscribe across uh, social media to Chrissy. Shout her out. Thank her for being on the show. Uh, Chrissy, we'll let you go. It's been awesome. Um, basically, not worthy. Uh, hope to run Chuckanut someday. It's it's in the woods that I grew up in, and it's one of those races that everyone has talked about that I've met and had on the show and uh, still have yet to run it. So can't wait. Good luck. It's coming up in, in 12 days. Yes. Uh, I hope it goes off without a hitch, and it's going to be awesome. Thanks. I was just going to say next year's the 25th running and I want to go big. I don't know what that means, but might put it on your calendar. It's always the third week in March. Uh, count me in uh, if, if I can get online fast enough. Uh, but yeah, wow, 25th <laughs> anniversary. That's pretty amazing. Thank you everyone for watching live tonight. Again, go follow Chrissy. Shout her out. Uh, we're going to do a very, very brief post show just with myself. Chrissy's got to go. Um, so stick around if you want to stick around for the post show. Maybe we can get through some of the questions in the chat room. But otherwise, that is it for tonight's episode. Tune in next Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another Ginger Runner Live, episode number 107. Very excited about next week's guest. Uh, no, no surprises. Um, you guys are going to love it. So we'll see you guys next week. And make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the Ginger Runner. That is it. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. <laughs>
awesome. For those of you that, that don't know, uh, she's super humble too. I was I was asking her before the show, like, hey, can we talk about, you know, all your accomplishments and all your races? And she's like, yeah, that's that's fine, but uh, you know, I, I'd rather not talk about a lot of like my own resume. Super humble, because uh, she's won an incredible number of races. Um, she's run a number of hundred milers and won. Uh, she's just a beast. So I highly encourage you to go follow her on social media just to kind of see what's up. And, uh, I can't wait. Chuck and I've been on my list of races. Just got to do, um, haven't had a chance to do it just because every time I go to register, it's usually already sold out, but it looks, it looks incredible. I've just been told that it's a fairly fast front end, uh, like front seven miles or so, seven or eight miles. And then a really grueling climb a really awesome descent. And then another, flat section towards the end. So it turns out to be a really fast 50K. I know a lot of the fast roadie guys tend to do really well on it. And there's always a huge turnout of fast uh, men and women that that show up to that race and just wreck it, just destroy it. So it's on my list of, of races that I've got to do at some point. And it's in the Northwest. Uh, there's really, uh, that's the selling point for me is getting back up to the Northwest trails. Absolutely love it up there. Um, so we weren't able to have her for the post show just because uh, she had a time limit. She had to be out by seven. And I think we, yes, we got her done by seven exactly, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, okay, so let's see. Kimosabe in the chat room says, any new album coming out? Love the singles, but these singles are teasers. Love to get a bunch of them like the grinds. Yes, new album, yes. Uh, I've been doing uh, a lot of uh, extra music work and stuff like that, putting the putting the album together. It's going to be an interesting album, this one. I'm very excited about it. More of a a, a bigger variety of of music, I think, from versus uh, Grinds, the first album. So yeah, there will be a new album coming. So just you know, stay tuned on social media. I'll be teasing it coming up in the in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm not going to give a delivery date yet because things are still being produced, but um, it will be soon. It's going to be within months. I don't know how many, but soon. All right. People were talking about watches and stuff like that uh, earlier on, and they recommended DC Rainmaker. I could not agree more. DC Rainmaker is one of the uh, the best uh, electronics and like gadget reviewers on the web when it comes to endurance sports and stuff like that. He's a triathlete specific, like more towards the triathlete endurance side of things. But he does tend to cover new gear from Garmin and Sunto and all the, the big watch manufacturers. I don't get how he gets... Well, I guess he buys the review samples, reviews them, or he gets the samples and then buys them for him. I don't know how he does it, but uh, it's very expensive. Uh, but yeah, he does He does a lot of that stuff. Great resource. One Another one of those super honest uh, reviewers that I trust and am happy to recommend because his recommendations are always spot on and very detailed far more detailed than I ever want to get into with my reviews, just because everything is so time consuming. And uh, he spends that time. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he balances. Ethan, are you drinking Pliny the Elder? No, it was not even close. I didn't even want to mention it because it's not great. Uh, Brewer's Cut, project number 17, Hells. Uh, it's just, I don't know, too generic, I think. It just doesn't taste, it doesn't taste like anything. Uh, really, really super tasty. Ginger, what about the Casey Neistat collaboration? Trust me, this is something that I've been wanting forever. Uh, hardest man to get a hold of. Um, I don't even know. Let's see, we have 169 viewers right now. We might be able to... We might, let, let's see, he's up. He's definitely up right now. He's probably editing his vlog. Uh, let's try, let's try, let's do an experiment right now. For those of you who are watching live, we're going to tweet Casey Neistat. We're going to do it all at once, but hold on. Don't do it yet. Because I think we we need to uh, we need to gather our thoughts here and make sure that we do it correctly. I'm going to pull up Twitter. Um, make sure I pull up the right Twitter feed. Uh, so maybe what I'll do is tweet at Casey Neistat, and maybe we can all retweet it or quote tweet and use a hashtag like Get Casey on GR Live or something like that. Let's see. Since we're live, let's figure this out together, shall we? Because. Casey Neistat's one of those YouTubers, vloggers that I look up to. I think he's fantastic. He's constantly being creative. He's creating new content every single day, uh, which I've toyed with, but I feel like it would it, it would take away from race films because then those would be less possible, uh, at least of the caliber that I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to create. Uh, but he's still an incredible creator. And not only do I want to, and a runner, I think that's, that's the connection, is that he's a runner. Uh, and an athlete. He's done triathlons. He's done marathons. We ran the New York Marathon, not together, but at the same time. 
uh, this last year. And I think he even ran it the year before, but he's very fast. He's fit. And uh, he's a guest that I would love to bring on the show to talk about running. Uh, so I think the first step would be to get him on the show, which I think is going to be very difficult for him to take 45 minutes to an hour out of his Monday evening would be, would be tough. Uh, so I think we can do it if we do it together. And it's going to be a matter of uh, all tweeting and all getting his attention because he's not going to listen to some guy named the Ginger Runner just tweeting at him saying, hey, come on my show. It means nothing. Uh, for someone at his level now, since he's at a 2.6 or 8 million subscriber level on YouTube, we need to make a, a wave on Twitter to get his attention. I think that's the best bet. So let's see if we can do this together, shall we? Um, okay, so I'm going to put together a tweet here. Uh, okay, so obviously my Twitter handle is at the Ginger Runner. His Twitter handle is at Casey Neistat. And I think people in the chat room have put that together. Uh, so let me write up a tweet here. You know what? Let me uh, let me thank Chrissy for being on the show first because I think that's that's definitely the first thing. So I'm going to thank Chrissy. Thank you for being an amazing guest tonight. Can't wait for Chuck Nut coverage. Hashtag GR live. Okay, cool. Chrissy was awesome. So I don't want to just like tweet Casey all of a sudden. Uh, the hashtag, like, yeah, okay. So let's come up with a hashtag, guys. Get Casey on GRL, Casey on GR Live, uh, Ginger and Nystat, Ginger and Casey. What do you guys think? Oh, someone's already tweeting it. Please get Ginger Runner. Careful, Jeremy. We can't do it yet. Yeah, Kim with the blend tech. <laughs> uh, Kim's making us dinner tonight. Uh, it is a uh, one of those Nutribullet things. It is like the best thing ever. We use it to make our salad dressing and shakes, recovery shakes, and all that good stuff. What do you guys think of these these hashtags? I just gave you a whole bunch. No one said anything. Uh, it's okay, Goku Runner. No, no problem. Hashtag get Casey on GR Live. Hashtag Casey on GR Live. Hashtag Casey. Uh, and Ginger, hashtag Ginger Casey collab. What do you guys think? Any of these click? Casey needs some ginger. Hashtag Casey needs some ginger. Casey needs ginger or, yeah. Project Ginger nice at. Oh, there we go. I like that. That's not bad. Project, Project Ginger nice at. Casey on GR Live. Ginger Casey collab. Casey needs Ginger. <laughs> Get Ginger Casey. Uh, these these are funny. These are really funny. Gin, gin, ginger Giner Jed. <laughs> Casey on GR Live. Ginger and Casey GRL. Casey kills Ginger with the dr yes. <laughs> Casey on GR. Make sure it's uh not too long, but Casey kills Ginger with the drone. Ginger needs Casey. Get Casey on GR Live. Casey, don't be a Dixical on Ginger <laughs> on her live. Get Ginger Casey. Casey on GR Live. Ginger does nice stat. Nice stat does Ginger. Nicey, let's do nice stat does GR Live. Yeah. Yeah, nice stat. Kim from the other room. Yeah. Nice stat does GR live. Okay, so let me let me tweet this, guys. Um, and then we can do this. Yo, at Casey. Get you on the show and talk about running. Nice stat on gr live is that what i said nice that on gr live casey does ginger or did i say nice that does gr live what did i say damn it i already forgot what i said i think i said nice that does gr live right nice that does okay that's it that's it guys let's do that uh okay so i'm going to tweet this out yo casey nice that let's get you on the show and talk about 
running. And drones. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's get you on the show and talk about running and drones. Retweet, favorite, copy, paste, everything. Everybody uh, who is watching currently live, uh, I just tweeted. I'm going to copy it and paste it into the chat room. So if you guys are watching and you don't use Twitter or something like that, uh, you can use other social sources. Uh, I said, yo, Casey, let's get you on the show and talk about running and drones. Nice hat, that's GR Live. For those of you who are going to tweet that, then maybe say, yo, Casey, and I said, let's get you on uh on the Ginger Runner show and talk about running and drones, right? So make sure that he sees that it's uh, at the Ginger Runner. Let's see what we can do. Look at that, tweets and favorites and all over that good stuff. Quotes and, and retweets and, and everything, great. This is the best bet. If we do this every Monday at the end of every show, maybe one of these days he'll just, hey, I saw that tweet and maybe he'll follow and I can direct message him and then we can talk about it. We'll see, cool. This is uh, the power of social media, hopefully. Wow, yeah, tons of tweets and likes and stuff. Thank you, guys. That's great. Awesome. We had 163, 164 live viewers now in the post show, so let's uh, let's just hope that that does something. I like seeing all the action. That's great. Uh, cool. So that's going to kind of wrap up the show. I think that's a great way to end because I think it's uh, pretty awesome. It would be crazy rad to, to collaborate with this guy do some sort of really cool running video on the mountains or something like that taking him on a trail run he comes to la frequently enough where i think we should be able to meet up uh just easily one of the hardest guys to get a hold of i believe his mail inbox he's shown screenshots of it before has like ten thousand unread emails so emails are, are very difficult uh i imagine he's the kind of guy that responds only to text messages that's it or maybe tweets so cool That'll wrap up today's live show. Again, show Chrissy some love. She's fantastic. And uh, the archive episode should be pretty much popped up right after I uh, shut the episode down. Um, thank you guys for the continued support. Always, if you want to help keep the lights on and the mic hot, uh, go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. If you are already not a part of the Patreon crew live or the Patreon crew, uh, consider joining. It's a buck a month at the bottom level and goes up from there, but there's different perks at each level. Uh, and as things this year get unveiled, we talked about, um, someone mentioned uh, Ginger Runner gear and stuff like that when it was going to be available. There's new things already in the works that Patreon crew will have advanced access to. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest perk. Um, it doesn't happen every month, but every couple of months there will be something new this year that they will have pre-order or discounts or you know different benefits to get some of the, the limited edition stuff. And the goal is to make a lot of that this year. So that's my plug. You guys are fantastic. Next week, really excited. Have a great rest of your night. Spend it with family, loved ones, or yourself. Whatever you guys want to do. Uh, that's it for tonight's show. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.